Welcome to our fourth uh, Warwick Lecture Series uh, from the Heritage Foundation of Williamson County. Um, I'm Blake Wintry. I'm the Director of Preservation here at the, the Heritage Foundation of Williamson County. So this is our fourth lecture of the year. And so it's our last lecture this year, but we'll restart again next year. Um, we have two of our lectures, and this third one will also be on our YouTube channel. Um, but earlier in the year, we had Rick Warwick talking about the photographer Lemuel Parker in Williamson County. And so you can go uh, find that on our YouTube page. And then back in September, we had Chris Kinder um, from the Tennessee Historical Commission talking about modernism in Middle Tennessee. Um, but tonight we have Dr. Mary Evans, um, who is the director of the American Democracy Project for Civic Learning. Um, and she's also a research uh, professor of history at MTSU. And tonight she's gonna speak on the recent 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which gave the women, uh, women the right to vote. Um, she's gonna talk about that also from a perspective of Tennessee. Um, her current research at MTSU's uh, University Honors Colleges College focuses on the powerful efforts of Tennessee women in the progressive era as agents of social, social change in their communities, including uh, the work toward the right to vote for women. Uh, so during this lecture, she'll elaborate on her research and the prominent women in Tennessee behind the movement. And she will also tell us about some of the um, uh, writing that's come out of this. I think there's a book project that will come out of this uh, lecture too. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Evans. Hey everybody, do I have my volume up high enough? Can everybody hear me just fine? I can hear just fine. Okay, good. I'm going to take that as a go. So thank you, um, Blake, for the introduction. And thank you so much to the uh, Heritage Foundation of Williamson County for inviting me to be here with you this evening from my uh, humble home office uh, to yours. Um, I just have can't help but be a sort of contemplative about the trajectory that we've all been on over the past um, nine months with this Zoom method we're certainly doing in our classes and our lectures and church services now and book clubs and public gatherings and our families even and cocktail hours with our best friends. So um, I've been thinking of it from a sort of Kubler-Ross perspective that we've all progressed from maybe back in March, the novelty and humor and intrigue of it all to kind of resistance to ultimate acceptance, maybe then to some boredom and then on to bitterness and pushback and then kind of um, a, an accepted resolve maybe and peace. And now we're sort of into an easygoing mundane normalcy here at nine months in. So anyway, I do think there's an easiness about all this um, because it's globally familiar. We're able to connect with people not only here across the US but really around the world. So that little piece of unity, um, we'll, we'll take it <laughs> and we'll find pleasure in it. So um, the talk this evening is really focusing on and is centered around the, um, the centennial commemoration, expanding the vote in the United States to women, sort of in recognition um, of that legal buy-in that women were and are, and in fact, citizens of the United States and are worthy of respect. And, and I would be remiss um, in fact, really negligent not to address the elephant in the room in November of 2020. And I say this because really all week at MTSU, this is what we've been doing. We've really been doing triage because we know after a presidential election for our 18 year olds, um, you know, for pretty much all of them, this is their first presidential election. And um, usually you can predict that 50% are elated and 50% are devastated. And that's not only true with the young people in our community, but it's really all across our community. So exactly one week ago today, the nation voted for president of the United States, just as it did 100 years ago in 1920. And in both cases, in both elections, women voted and voted for the candidacy <laughs> who has, was politically defined in the nomenclature of both eras as, as in representing normalcy. That was the wording used by Warren G. Harding in that 1920 campaign. And it was widely applied to the Biden campaign uh, in the United States to sort of return some measure of calm and national tranquility. So those 100 year apart campaigns also have other remarkable parallels between them. 
Um, they were both carried on during a time of global pandemic and each of the outgoing presidents, intriguingly, uh, caught the virus and recovered from it. And each of the outgoing presidents um, tried to sort of suppress the bad news of the virus and minimize its impact on the country. So we've learned a lot more about this whole political era of 100 years ago um, when women took the stage as voters, not only due to the focus on the centennial celebration this year, but also because of the coronavirus and the parallels that have been drawn. They've been researched and new facts have come to light. It's become newly fresh in our minds and um, the correlations that exist between those two. That American women have significantly contributed to the victory of Biden is clear from the early exit polling. Uh, we know it's white women, suburban women, urban women, young women, African-American women, uh, Hispanic women, Native American women, immigrant American women, educated women, women in the lower economic brackets also. And these data are preliminary now, of course, and we'll study them for years to come. They'll become more articulated and refined when all of the states have officially and formally uh, submitted their um, certified election numbers, and that has not happened yet. <laughs> it's under contention yet, but um, we know that that'll take a good long while. In fact, um, if memory serves me correctly, I think in, after following the 2018 interim elections that Alabama did not finalize its numbers through its Secretary of State's office until the summer of 2019. And I know that for a fact because I was awaiting some number crunching from a national organization that supplies those numbers about student voting and they couldn't nationwide crunch the numbers until the last of the Secretary of State's offices had reported in. So I believe I'm correct that that was the, the state that was the outlier uh, in 2018 and really took quite a number of months for that to be resolved. So we've been trying to tell our students to be patient that um, We'll, we'll see what we will see, and hopefully it will be resolved by January 20th. Anyway, we have the capacity um, to know in greater detail about women's voting in 2020 due to the types of data that we collect. And we also know that our true representative democracy is based on the votes of all of its citizens. Um, those are the lessons that we know from the battles to win the fight for the right for the average common man to vote back in this country in the 1830s, the non-landholding man, and for the right of African-American men to sort of uh, be allowed to be deigned to uh, be able to cast their vote when the 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870, and about the years of struggle for women to be legally recognized as citizens finally in 1920 with the 19th Amendment. And for the years and years of legislation and Supreme Court decisions that really only inched forward the full citizenship of Native Americans and Asian Americans and the physical battles and brutalities and, and disrespect and fear and murders that were undergone by African Americans for us to finally begin to move beyond Jim Crow laws into greater equality under the law in the United States. So as I undertake this presentation tonight, let me be clear about my position about women and voting. So I'm for it. <laughs> if anyone has ever been part of a marginalized population and personally knows what that feels, it's impossible not to see and feel others disfranchisement and realize just how wrong that is. And when people's right to vote is minimized, such as students on university campuses who are not provided polling places where they live and study, or such as people who in a time of a health crisis fear for their health and are not permitted to vote absentee, or if they have voted absentee, their sort of sense of disquiet because their vote is being questioned or is considered suspect. And, and such as former felons who are denied their citizenship because they made a mistake in their lives early on. And if they've paid their debt to society, but they get out, it's gonna cost them so much money in litigation in order to be allowed to vote in their own state. Um, and, and sadly, the people who, who study this stuff, and I'm not one of those, but we have um, very prominent felon disfranchisement has been uh, scholar who's been part of the history department at MTSU for a number of years. And 
her most recent data are that um, Tennessee is the single most repressive state in the entire country for um, the ability of former felons to gain their right to vote back. So all of those variables are, are relevant as we consider citizenship and voting. Um, and it's, it's been difficult for many. And why, why is that? Um, and really, we know why it is. It's all about power and it's trying to keep a stranglehold on our privilege. Uh, again, because anybody who's ever been marginalized or disfranchised or minimized is always going to understand and vote to expand access and citizenship and rights and privileges for others. That's just how that works. So this is the centennial of the 19th Amendment and of the 100 years of celebrating the right for women to vote in this country and vote we do. So um, I was going to start my PowerPoint right about here but we've already set it up and I think it's good to go. Rachel Finch and I worked for about three years together um, at the MTSU Center for Historic Preservation and she was the one who was gracious enough to ask me to come tonight um, to be a part of this talk with you all and I'm pleased to do that, I'm pleased to be able to do that. She asked me because this is what I study, um, the actions and roles of Tennessee women that positioned them to be able to accomplish um, this objective of voting for all the women of the United States. And I've posted here the title of my anthology that was published back in 2013, a number of years ago. Um, and I've also posted to the right of that, um, the name of the new publication that's gonna be out. That's a tentative title though, honestly with um, co-edited by one of my friends and colleagues at Austin Peay State University um, with contributions really by just every possible Tennessee scholar on Tennessee and women and the progressive era. Um, and both of these books are ones that we're all very proud of. I'll linger on this for a minute just to say that there's been an awful lot published about about Tennessee women over the years in, in many capacities. Um, the scholarship is not new, it's pretty thorough, it's been, uh, been very interesting. And of course, there's just been an awful lot published on suffrage as well. There's really rich research on this that's gone on about the role played by Tennessee women in the ratification of the 19th Amendment. I expect that most of you have read Elaine Weiss's book because of these, it's the most current. Um, she's sort of the latecomer, if you will, to this study, but because of the timing of her publication, a lot of book clubs have taken to reading Elaine Weiss's book. Um, we've been lucky here in Tennessee to have had this work and to have um, been able to lay the groundwork for it. And of course, not only do we have books, but we have a lot of documentaries. There are the classic older ones. There was a whole spate of um, documentaries on suffrage that were produced for the 75th anniversary back in the 1990s, the ones on Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Um, but there have been more recent ones and PBS and American Experience have recently done this great documentary, which I hope you all have, have seen. It's a multi-staged one, so not just one hour, but several hours but I think you have to have PBS Passport in order to be able to watch it. But I absolutely recommend it to you. Um, but I also totally recommend the production by Nashville Public Television. And uh, it was produced by NPT's former president, Beth Curley, and NPD, NPT producer, writer, and director, Mary Mackley, and then NPT president, Kevin Crane, who generated by one vote, woman suffrage in the South. And again, there's so many Tennessee women historians who are in this and this particular um, documentary really focuses on Tennessee and I, I recommend it to you. And then there's this one called Silent No More, the story of American suffrage, which was produced by MTSU. Uh, it's also really fine, the MTSU Center for Educational Media along with my organization, the MTSU American Democracy Project, um, produced this one. And I can email um, 
to the foundation, the links to all three of these films if you're interested, but I'm hoping you've all seen them already um, because they're really so good and timely and they're, they're sort of what we're, what we're focusing on this year. So I'm here to talk about citizenship explicitly and women's role in the public sphere, and I'm absolutely happy to do that um, because certainly 2020 has been quite a year, <laughs> and um, it's not only been the centennial year of the 19th Amendment and a presidential election year and a global pandemic year, but um, and I'm intriguingly, I made this slide back in June when the coronavirus death toll had not yet reached 100,000. Today, we're at almost 240,000 deaths across the United States from COVID-19. So among all the parts of 2020 that we're all gonna remember um, this year, and you know, we'll look back on it with the eyes of history in due course, but um, I think we'll be able to say this was a historic moment for all sorts of reasons. And one of them being that people really took to the streets demanding social change. And um, this is kind of a reflection of the civic action that women were doing a uh, hundred years ago. And that that level of civic action does produce hopefully legislative, judicial and constitutional shifts that, that can change the, the course of our country. And I can't help but think that the public actions and waves of citizens engagement in the streets throughout the spring and summer of this year and on the digital airwaves um, have demanded this greater equality and protections and institutional justice for all Americans. And they've, they've influenced the presidential election. And we'll just see how um, future legislation and judicial decisions and outcomes develop in the, in the months and years ahead. And ongoing shifts that markedly moved our nation forward, bending the arc of the moral universe toward in, in justice continue, and they must continue, as we've done it in the past. Um, we're a nearly 250-year-old nation. We've gone through multiple eras in which the will of the American people demanded that we change course. So we're paying close attention this year, and we're living through history being made. And as I tell my students, just pay attention. I mean, these are things that you'll be able to discuss with your grandchildren because you lived through it all. Um, and we're participating in it, all of us as Americans and citizens, because we're all agents of change. We are participants in democracy. Um, and our outstanding voter participation numbers just last week in the national elections really affirmed this. I'm really so proud of us as a country. Um, we're doing exactly what our founders asked us to do, to be engaged in the governance of our country. And we've made our voices heard. We are literally silent no more. So I write as a historian on women as civic actors because I study women. Uh, but in addition to being a research professor of history, um, I oversee MTSU's Center for Citizenship and Democracy, which is our chapter of the American Democracy Project, or ADP. And it has multiple functions within any university, as within ours. It does civic learning across the disciplines and institutionalizing civic learning and democratic engagement as central, not peripheral to the university's identity and as pervasive, not partial within the university structure. We advocate for a culture of inclusion and we try to advance student voting with the goal that 100% of our students should vote. <laughs> and, and we do that, of course, in a state where we actually have the, one of the lowest voter turnouts in the country but we'd like to see student voting move um, that, that needle forward in Tennessee. Um, I realize that 100% student voting, 100% voting of all citizens is aspirational, but those are goals that we, that we should have. They should be a reality, not just aspiration. And we know that there are structural problems that sort of limit that. Um, and, and Tennessee is, struggles with some of those. We know that low voter turnout is not an accident. Um, we look back to the numbers in past elections and, and Tennessee has been among the states that's made voting more difficult. Um, low voter turnout is directly tied to systemic issues, to whether there's no excuse absentee voting, which has certainly come under question this fall, mail out balloting, which has come under question this fall, automatic voter registration, which we also don't have, 
election day voter registration. I can, I can attest as a university professor that that would certainly benefit many of our students who put it off and put it off and being able to go register on election day would be great, but we don't have that in our state. And um, we have extended our voting periods. We appreciate so much our early voting in Tennessee, but we have really strictly confined voter ID laws. And although that works for some people, it doesn't work for others. And the student population has, has issues and struggles in that regard. And I've already mentioned the harsh voter restrictions for former felons, um, the you know, variability in polling hours and polling places. And um, every state is different. And in Tennessee, among our 95 counties, every county is different. Um, so we have a lot of variables that we all have to navigate. And really what, we're, what we wish to bring about is a culture where there is societal trust among ourselves and that it's a civic culture in which everyone knows it's his or her responsibility to engage in, in governance and be a part of the electoral process. So to summarize, ease of voting is really a key predictor of voter turnout and states with the most restrictive voting laws have the least voter turnout. And conversely, states with the least restrictive voting laws have the most voter turnout. And um, again, we're gonna be watching how these numbers play out. We won't be able to crunch the numbers until some weeks and months down the pike, but we've been comparing 2018 and 2016. Um, there's a lot can be said about this. And we do know that Tennessee has had low numbers and Tennessee has had deterrence. And, you know, it makes you wonder whether we want everybody to vote in Tennessee. Um, but we're not here to speak about the current political voting climate, nor to break down the history of the last hundred years in terms of political climate. But we are here to talk about um, what went on a hundred years ago. And it's very clear that in 1920, Tennessee stood out as a very different cultural and political landscape than today. We were considered historically and across the nation as a moderate state. And we were deemed nationally to be moderate. We were the state to which the National American Woman's Suffrage Association, NAWSA or NASA, turned in order to achieve the successful passage of the 19th Amendment. The United States Congress passed the 19th Amendment in the early summer of 1919. It passed the House of Representatives on May 21st, 1919. And then exactly two weeks later, it passed the United States Senate June 4th of 1919. And at which point, the amendment, of course, then had to be ratified by 36 states out of our then 48 states, as laid out in Article 5 of the US Constitution, in order for the Women's Suffrage Amendment to become officially part of the US Constitution. And ratification came down to states in the South as the deciding region of the country. Georgia and Alabama in the South had voted in 1919 soon thereafter in the summer of 1919 against the ratification of the 19th, blocking it. And it was these Southern states, these two states that were the first no votes to attempt to bring down the amendment. But conversely, five Southern states or Southern-ish states had actually voted for the 19th. Texas did, Missouri, Arkansas, those three were June and July of 1919, and also Kentucky and West Virginia. Now, Texas had voted for it as early as June of 1919 because Texas wanted to align itself with the Western states that had already provided woman suffrage in their regions of the US. Kentucky voted um, in favor of it in January of 1920, and then West Virginia toward the tail end of March of 1920. So by the end of March of 1920, 35 states in total had ratified the 19th Amendment, mostly states in the North, Midwest and the West. So which state would be the 36th state? And clearly there was hope that some final Northern state would bring the 36th, would bring in the 36th and solidify that ratification. Um, there was great hope that lay actually in the state of Delaware. NASA and its dogged and persistent leader, Carrie Chapman Kett, 
through all of their efforts into bringing in Delaware in the spring of 1920 as the 36th state. But then on June 2nd, the Delaware legislature voted it down. So who was left then? Well, six Southern states had expressly rejected the 19th Amendment, not only Georgia and Alabama, but also by then South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, and Mississippi. And most of the states that had not yet voted were either antagonistic and unsympathetic to the cause or were rife with internal political struggles and internecine warfare within each state, blocking its legislature from, from um, meeting. So the South was really the least likely region in the whole country to bring in the 19th Amendment, but options were exceedingly narrow at this point. In the North, Vermont's governor stood in the way of calling a special legislative session. Vermont's vote wouldn't come until 1921 missing the presidential election of November 1920. And Connecticut's legislature would meet in the fall of 1920. So there was had been some potential there, but, um, but the Connecticut vote, if it came, would be too late for uh, enfranchising women for that November 1920 election cycle. Plus, there was advantage in breaking down the Southern Bloc. Um, that was very much needed. It would be very symbolic if one of the Southern states were to jump on board and show buy-in and it would provide greater national integration of the idea of voting for women. And at that point, the beginning of June of 1920, the legislatures of four Southern states, they were Louisiana, North Carolina, Florida, and Tennessee had just not yet taken it up. So Louisiana, Louisiana legislature voted no on July 1. Florida wouldn't take it up at all. North Carolina was potentially in play, but its legislature voted to postpone discussion and then voted it down. So Tennessee seemed like the suffragists only chance. And you'll note on my humble little map that I hand drew on the screen, the dates when the holdout states did ultimately ratify the 19th amendment formally after the fact and you got to chuckle that Mississippi didn't ratify until 1984. So just saying. Anyway, uh, right after Louisiana's July 1st rejection of the amendment, West Tennessean Sue Shelton White, as chairperson of the Tennessee branch of the National Woman's Party, the NWP, which was a younger and somewhat more radical woman suffrage group, headed nationally by Quaker Alice Paul out of their headquarters in Washington, DC, which um, then as the Congressional Union of NASA had organized the Women's March on Washington back in 1913. Um, they were the ones who had marched down um, Pennsylvania Avenue prior to the arrival of newly elected President Woodrow Wilson before his inauguration and then in during World War I had picketed in front of the White House during those war years, which had resulted in their arrests and their hunger strikes in the Occoquan prison that ultimately brought President Woodrow Wilson to his knees to finally advocating for woman suffrage before the US Senate in September of 1918. So it was our own Sue White, the Tennessee chair of the National Woman's Party who wrote Alice Paul, the national chair of the Women's Party, imploring for Alice Paul um, to send a fast inflow of dollars for the summer's work ahead in Tennessee. Ms. Paul, in turn, contacted her national network of National Women's Party suffragists, begging for fresh immediate donations to support Tennessee women in the summer struggle. Ms. Paul's letter to the Women's Party membership and her mailing list said, the opponents of suffrage are already amassing their strength in Tennessee as they did in Delaware. And unless funds are immediately raised to make possible a thorough campaign in Tennessee, suffrage may lose in this state as it did in Delaware. And Tennessee offers the only opportunity, according to the present outlook, to win the last needed state before the elections. And if this opportunity is lost, millions of women will probably be debarred from voting this November. Also in this New York Times article, Sue White's letter to Alice Paul is published. And Ms. Sue White writes, we face a terrible fight. 
the anti-suffragists are appealing to deeply rooted prejudices and pouring vitriol into old wounds. We're being fought persistently by daily newspapers. Ms. White goes on to say that our state's geography was so extremely difficult to traverse with so many counties from east to west through all the back roads and across the really poor wagon tracks with 132 members of the Tennessee General Assembly to lobby. She said, we need 15 organizers. And she tells Alice Paul where exactly each of these organizers should be stationed to work, what districts and counties each must cover to accomplish the objective. These are the conditions, she says, and there's so much at stake. She wished Tennessee could pick up the cost of its own, but because of the national import of this vote, the, and, and also because of the narrow one month window of time, she needs the National Women's Party to chip in financially and for the women from all over the country to rise up and meet this critically important moment to women, as she says, and to women of all the states in the United States. So the National Women's Party gets to work in this final leg, driven by Sue Shelton White of Tennessee. And meanwhile, NASA also set to work. NASA and its affiliate organizations at the state level, including the Tennessee Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and I must say parenthetically that the NASA connected groups get the majority of the historic writings about suffrage work in Tennessee, but the National Women's Party was really also very busy here. There were many, many hands on deck. So on July 5th of 1920, the same date as the New York Times article about Sue Shelton White and the National Women's Party gearing up for the final battle, Carrie Chapman Catt, NASA's national chair in New York, wrote to her counterparts in Tennessee. She wrote to Ann Dallas Dudley and Abby Crawford Milton and Catherine Talty Kenny, providing them encouragement with detailed instructions and political analysis and urging them forcefully on I entreat you to begin at once, Kat wrote urgently. But then negatively she admonished, no matter how well the women may work or how effective their results may be, ratification in Tennessee will go through the work and action of men. And the great motive that will finally put it through will be political and nothing else. We have long since recovered from our previous faith in the action of men based on a love of justice. Get the cooperation of every man who stands behind the politics of the state of Tennessee, and you must get the men of every faction. So she's telling these women, you must appeal to Democrats and Republicans alike, conservatives and progressives alike. That's her astute political wisdom. This must be the work across the state, says Carrie Chapman Catt. And 12 days later, Catt herself showed up in Nashville to work with the Tennessee women in this struggle for the remainder of the summer to reel this project in. Kat had said in that same letter of July 5th that suffragists and anti-suffragists will flood Tennessee. And she was really right. They all did come. Tennessee was ground zero. Tennessee would be the state to finally ratify the 19th Amendment and make it happen for all the women of the United States. And the details and politics of all that happened that summer it was brass knuckle politicking, down and dirty, hot and sweaty, under the table deals, political favors called in, booze, bribes, finagling, as Kat called it, which is most assuredly wisdom for the present day for the naive among us. We have long since recovered from our previous faith in the action of men based on a love of justice, she said. And to be clear, it's still white men who are in charge politically in the, in the United States and in Tennessee for the most part on our boards and committees and commissions and utility cooperatives and inner circles of power on the bar and at the bench at the municipal court, state and federal levels. We're so proud of the women involved in all of these, but um, assuredly in the state of Tennessee and around the country making these decisions has been bare knuckles politicking dominantly um, held by <laughs> white males and usually the love of justice is not necessarily what's on the agenda. So Carrie Chad admonished of the, us of that in 1920. And um, interestingly, if you don't know this, um, on August 17th in 1920, on the floor of the Tennessee House of Representatives in the General Assembly at the State Capitol, our Speaker of the State House, whose name was Seth Walker, stated clearly to his fellow legislators, and I quote, we want this to remain a white man's country, he said, 
end quote. And he could not have been more clear and explicit about what um, the objectives of the legislature was. So anyway, the details of that perfect 36 story of how Tennessee did become the national hero, um, that's what all of us have been really celebrating this year, commemorating, talking about uh, with our students, our fellow Tennesseans, our fellow Americans in other states. And, you know, we've, we've been polishing our buttons because um, it's true that many of the, our fellow Americans across the country have not really understood to what extent Tennessee was so pivotal in this story. Again, um, these are the books that I referred you to earlier. They're, they are the ones that really tell in great detail the Perfect 36 story. I wanna say that in addition to our second volume that's coming out on Tennessee Women Progressives, um, Marjorie Spruill, who's really just the foremother of this work in Tennessee, is reworking and updating Votes for Women. And also the Tennessee Historical Quarterly is about to release um, its dedicated issue on Tennessee's battle for women's suffrage with some wonderful new papers that are gonna be included in it, some really important new work. And for the folks who wanna watch it on film and not in book, there are those documentaries that I mentioned. Um, then I'm also gonna do shout outs to the Tennessee State Museum. If you have not yet been, it is actually open, the ratified exhibit, um, Tennessee Women and the Right to Vote. It's really actually open, wearing masks, of course, you can go to it. And the downtown Metro Nashville Public Library's brand new Votes for Women's Suffrage Room. Unfortunately, that opening has been delayed. Um, but when it does open, it's gonna be great. And the advantage of it is not just a momentary exhibit. It's gonna be there um, available to us for, for years and years to come. And in terms of years and years to come, that's what's true about the wonderful new statuary and historic markers that we're, that we're getting now that are really going up across the state. Thanks to community groups and municipalities and civic organizations and, and historical societies such as your own who understand that marking events and people gives them power and voice and visibility and validity in our present lives. And this is public history in action. Um, I must make a side comment to state that similarly, the continued monuments to actions and actors engaged in cruelty and discrimination also gives those power, those individuals power and voice and visibility and validity in our present lives. So let's upgrade the narrative and be on the right side of history by including more and more women and people of color and, and really complexifying um, our statuary and monuments and markers across the state so that we're more representative of um, what our current Tennessee is really all about. The women of the Tennessee Women's Suffrage Monument Committee really deserve enormous thanks for their years and years of work on um, the wonderful suffrage memorial that's at Centennial Park. And also the Tennessee Women's Suffrage Heritage Trail that's online and it's mapped so that Tennesseans can travel and go from location to location and see women's history popping up in every little community across the state. So these are, these are fabulous. Um, so again, all of these are really sort of trying to mark the actions of women in the public sphere and also the perfect 36 suffrage story and our state's vital role. But the backstory, of course, is how was Tennessee positioned to be able to accomplish this in the first place? What made it doable across the landscape of 95 Tennessee counties with geographical microcultures and diverse local needs characterized by Tennessee's historic political divisions of East, Middle and West? Well, women began moving within their communities, regional, social, economic, religious, and political arenas, initially in acceptable ways, out of the private sphere and into the public sphere, out of the home and taking on public roles in the community and in public life, so much so that local communities and small Tennessee towns began creating places for women to be when they would come to town. It became apparent that women's physical needs had to be responded to. Um, they couldn't just go into the county seat and endure life that was rough and tumble. Society begins to be acknowledging by the beginning of the 20th century that women are part of courthouse life and they can come to the county seat and be involved in going to town on Saturday and ladies restrooms are being provided inside stores, inside the county courthouse itself. Spaces are created in libraries 
Women are now part of the public sphere and accommodations have to be made in town. And this notice that I've posted was from a newspaper in O'Brien County in 1911. Surely such facilities began even earlier than that across Tennessee as women moved into the public spaces and in their respective communities. This is an image, this photo dates though recently to 1995 when Dr. Carol Van West, who's known to all of you, our state historian from the Center for Historic Preservation at MTSU, he submitted this building to the National Registry of Historic Places. And this is a separate building. It was built in Lewisburg in Marshall County, not until 1924. Then um, it survived until very recent days. And it's obviously much finer. It was a much more rare option because um, usually what was created for women was just a spot in the courthouse. It had to be designated for ladies. But those creations were purposeful and they were intentional and they had to be made to happen. So the physical public spaces of Tennessee begin more and more to reflect and mirror the greater visibility and acceptance and ordinariness of women in the public domain, really in the early years of the 20th century. So again, this is explicit politicization of women's roles in society by this time and their greater acceptance in the public sphere. And, and when did all this really begin? So that's up for debate. We can pick our starting point. You know, people go back to citing Abigail Adams uh, in the 1700s, but um, it can be argued realistically from multiple perspectives. The Civil War is a pretty darn good place to start. A lot's been writ on the, written on this. Every Southern and every Tennessee household and family was impacted by the Civil War. Women ran things at home and took on the work and leadership roles in their farms and in their families in the absence of men. And they were the ones who carried pistols and protected their families in the same way that Rosie the Riveters of the 1940s propelled the women's movement of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. So women's roles during the Civil War positioned women for experiences that empowered them. And although Drew Gilpin Faust's monograph on this very subject focuses on the white women who ran and maintained the household economies when the men were away during the Civil War, it was absolutely true for African-American women as well who were strong and were relied upon and were tenacious. And after the war is when there is an increase in participation in women's organizations and actions outside the home. Really, perhaps everything stems from these core platforms, church groups, women's clubs, women's education, and women's work as nurturers. And there are component pieces of that um, as those formats begin to expand and grow. Um, women physically need to get around and do stuff and they have to have greater physical mobility. So we begin to see women's dress changing to accommodate these changes in society. Women meeting up for sports and playing tennis and here in these images, playing basketball. Women's dress changed over a very short period of time. Um, if you look at the picture from 1898 and compare that to the image from 1926, we're talking about really <laughs> just about a 25 year period and the changes were absolutely unbelievable. So what were these categories of women's work in Tennessee? Church groups, Bible societies, and missionary societies started out humbly enough, um, taking on the Lord's work in their communities and their churches, and then it began to expand out. Um, problem solving, protecting young women and needy women, caring for women, widows, and orphans, caring for the elderly, Women's clubs often started as sewing circles and they began to expand into study clubs and learning groups and, and women's sororities. Um, they started moving on from um, tatting and sewing into community issues and city beautification and cleaning up the streets and establishing libraries. Um, women's clubs started taking topics to study and learn about. And as they learned more about issues, they began moving toward greater activism. In terms of education, obviously teaching their children was, was considered woman's work, but they're advancing in education outside the home and in educational administration. And it's gonna be true for black women as well as white women, because after the Civil War, we had a segregated um, school system and black women educators in that segregated system 
were teaching across Tennessee's rural communities and in the cities. They were lifting um, while they climb. They were being exemplars of politics of respectability, as Dr. Beverly Bond writes about at the University of Memphis. Um, and white women educators in this segregated system, there were various ways in which they helped. They were moving within public schools and private schools. Republican women, Northern women, formerly Union women were contributing. And of course, Confederate women were um, being active in schools under the umbrella of the United Daughters of the Confederacy narrative. They were advocating for the lost cause. It turns out, of course, that, they, that that particular group, the UDC, were leading anti-suffragists as well. Um, but in their promotion of, Confeder of the Confederacy, they were also um, working within schools and they were unlikely women educators, but they were absolutely doing it. And they were the ones too who brought us so many of um, the Confederate markers on buildings and, and our statuary as well. Um, in terms of education, another component piece of what women were doing during this time period is settlements and settlement houses. We usually think of settlement houses as being in the North, but they were certainly also in Appalachia. In the montane areas, there was Appalachian development of the impoverished um, communities, poor farming communities in West Tennessee and around Middle Tennessee. There were needy communities in the cities and women were acting across racial lines doing settlements in urban centers as well. And in terms of caring and, and nurturing under public health and supplying food and women supplying milk and milk stations for babies. Um, as women are moving into these areas of public nursing, um, the, the issues get bigger and stronger. For instance, if we're gonna get rid of cholera, we need to drain the swamps out of the cities. And again, um, a lot of the components broke down into categories. The Northern formerly Union women who were of the Republican party in the latter part of the 1800s operated often under the Women's Relief Corps, the WRC, which was the auxiliary of the Grand Army of the Republic trying to educate for American citizenship. And the United Daughters of the Confederacy were tending to vets and, and wives of vets and widows um, doing Confederate care through homes and um, other facilities that the UDC operated. And communities were providing for their own teachers and caring for retired women and women who couldn't take care of themselves. So this work was urban. It was happening through urban settlements and inner cities. And women were taking on jobs um, out in the public sphere as secretaries and as clerks and working in factories. They were finding housing in YWCAs and in rural areas. Uh, women were taking on jobs as well as local shopkeepers in towns and working as postal clerks. And um, farm women were working on economic activism, trying figure figuring out ways to to, to make and sell butter outside of their home communities, trying to figure out ways to get it shipped into Nashville so that city women could buy uh, from them so that they could financially benefit. Canning clubs and tomato clubs and home demonstration clubs and country life programs were developing uh, for, for rural women. And women were engaged in all of this through the latter part of the 1800s and into the beginning of the 20th century. Now, a lot of this was in, in parallel singular universes but many of it was overlapping. And there were uh, not only um, ways in which we were completely and fully segregated, but there were tender um, crossovers in terms of race as well and, and activities in which black and white women contributed with each other. So the question is, was this political? <laughs> and, and I respond, absolutely it was. Any definition of political that is too narrow, has to be broadened. Um, all politics is local. When you are doing societal civic work in your community, if you're contributing and doing community service, you are part of the political voice in the community in which you live. Women's advocacy in the ch church was happening. They were addressing constraints of religious patriarchy. A woman by the name of Selena Holman, who was the Tennessee head of the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union, for 30 darn years wrote um, an article inside the Gospel Advocate because she was taking on David Lipscomb on the pages of the Gospel Advocate talking about the new woman and the roles for women in the church and the roles for women in society. And he was universally sort of using her as a, um, a punching board to sort of knock her down and say, oh, how silly Mrs. Holman is. 
Um, but she was finding her voice and, and moving her voice publicly. Black women were a challenging authority through Freedmen's Courts. Callie House of Tennessee worked for reparations for African-Americans. And this wasn't just in the years after the Civil War and during Reconstruction, but from the late 1800s going on into the 20th century. White women were taking on women's issues in their county courts. They were often being shot down and voted against, but they were coming for issues that they needed to see addressed. And um, the fact that they were looking to protect the rights of women within their communities. Women were standing up against lynching, um, notably so, and being important advocates to try to end that practice that was undertaken really in their name. And during World War I, of course, was a prime time for women's civic action. Women were really choosing their roles in World War I as a way to display their patriotism and their citizenship in this country. And just by um, preparing packages to send to the soldiers overseas and the work they were doing in their communities to support the war effort, these were considered strong manifestations of women's civic actions within their communities that had national import. Certainly the temperance movement was an important precursor for suffrage and temperance was highly political. And Tennessee women had um, incredible success in the state of Tennessee, active, acting, organizing and working to have um, legislation brought before the Tennessee uh, General Assembly. Temperance unions were pretty much in every county and every little town across Tennessee. And that's gonna be mapped in our forthcoming anthology. And suffrage societies were pretty much in every county in Tennessee, mostly. We are learning this, we're trying to map this and we intend to in our forthcoming anthology. And honestly, another thing that we're finding out is that schools for women, schools that educated women, either women's colleges or seminaries um, or co-educational institutions in which women were being educated, these were literally all over the state. And I have begun this map. Um, this was true for both white women and black women. Um, all of those schools that you see on that map um, are embedded across the state. There are many holes in the map. There are many counties that you see as empty. And that represents more my lack of information than the fact that the schools didn't exist. Uh, already since I made this map, I've had a few more people email me and contact me and say, oh, my county um, had a women's school and they've sent me the sources, the information on that. So I'm absolutely on a quest to tease this out because the more we know about how women were educated across the state, the more we begin to understand how the notion of uh, the vote for women and women's visibility in the public sphere has, is becoming more and more widely accepted. So please, uh, my email address is gonna be at the very end of this PowerPoint and I would really genuinely love it if you would email me some sources to help flesh out this list and help make my map more full. So there's a lot that can be said about how women moving into the public sphere and how their lives were expanding actions um, across Tennessee. I'm gonna see what my next, <laughs> my next slide is, but I want to talk about three of these women's colleges um, specifically, just a, just a super brief sample. Um, in West Tennessee, in Chester County, the Georgia Robertson College, which was affiliated with then the Christian Church, the Church of Christ, one of its uh, alumna is Sue Shelton White, who goes on to, to represent us in Washington and be a part of the um, National Woman's Party. Uh, in Middle Tennessee, in Warren County, there was the Cumberland Female College. It was associated with the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And one of its uh, alumna is a woman by the name of Mary Stakely Cunningham. Um, she had a long career as um, the public librarian in that county from 1913 until 1958, as a matter of fact. She was most assuredly a, a very visible public woman. In East Tennessee, I've just marked McMinn County where there was Athens Female College. It was run by the Methodist Church. And of course, one of its very famous graduates was Phoebe or Feb 
Emsminger Byrne, the mother of Harry Byrne, who wrote that famous letter to her son that he must um, support Mrs. Cat and suffrage. So yeah, Tennessee was positioned to accomplish the politics of suffrage really all across the state from the urban counties and cities that do get most of the attention to the rural counties. And again, we have 95 counties in Tennessee and really I'm advocating that it's true that the busy legwork of this work for women in the public sphere was happening everywhere across the state and we're just having the hardest time uncovering it. And we count on you to help add information so that we can flesh all of these out. Supporting the expansion and citizenship and the rights of Americans to vote, to fully participate in the ongoing formation of the more perfect union is always the correct thing to do, even if it means lessening the tight grips of the few on what they deem to be their control, their prerogative of power. And, and this we know, power is never given up. It has to be taken and the rights we have and those we still have difficulty accessing are always about power. Who has it? Who doesn't have it? Who wants it? Who doesn't want to give it up? So we continue to fight and we struggle for full suffrage and full citizenship for all Americans. That's women's story, but it's also the American story that we continue to struggle to maintain um, the rights of citizenship for all of our American citizens. That's, that's the work of being a citizen in this country. So this is the year and it's on into 2021 and beyond, that we're called to action to know that it's responsibility for each of us to keep our democracy. And the historic year of suffrage has been upended by coronavirus, and the historic year of suffrage has been upended by maybe a greater eye-opening on the parts of all of us to the full extent of continued racism in America. Um, voting rights and human rights must never be taken for granted, and they demand full-on civic participation. And as the women and African Americans of 100 years ago knew, the work for equity and citizenship demands courage, and it demands making people uncomfortable, and it demands taking to the streets, as so many Americans have done this year. Suffragists were considered radical in their day, and yet today we honor them and we applaud them, and even our state's most conservative um, applaud and, and claim this suffrage history for Tennessee, which is complete irony because 100 years ago, um, many of the folks might, might well have been anti-suffragists, doggedly in opposition to the vote for women. Because widening suffrage meant, and it continues to mean, systemic change, and it is a demand for policy change and for inclusion. So the entire reason we study history is to think about and consider and evaluate and reflect on its relevance in our lives today, how we got here, what we need to learn from history in order to move forward and improve so that every day we're becoming a more perfect union. History is our mirror and it reflects into the present times. It's the platform from which we see, evaluate and construct today's world. And otherwise we're just compiling names and dates. So. We take meaning from and interpret those stories. And that's what informs us as sentient beings and as Tennesseans today. So I'm gonna leave us this evening just with one more image, um, another important Tennessee woman progressive who took on policy and politics in the late 1800s and early 20th century, but was not successful in accomplishing her objective. And that again, I mentioned her earlier is Mrs. Callie House of Rutherford County who fought through the courts to achieve the financial rebalancing that white position and privilege had denied African Americans. There was not structural parity. And then 300 years of enslavement and systemic exclusion had assured that. And Ms. Kelly pushed to see that that um, idea or promise or <laughs> hypothesis of 40 acres and a mule might potentially become enacted. But here in 2020, the discussion of reparations is achieving new visibility with the realization by white America that we have deep institutional inequities that we still need to address. So valuing the citizenship of all Americans is what we think about this year, I think, both in line with the presidential election and the introspection that coronavirus has given us and with the, the, the joy of being able to celebrate uh, 100 years of women voting. And we know that when we stand on the side of our fellow Americans, we're standing on the correct side of history. Um, I wanna thank you so much for your time and attention this evening. And um, 
if I'm able to answer any of your questions, I'm surely willing to give it a try. And um, you're most kind to have me. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize, well, it probably sounds ignorant. I didn't realize there was so much literature has been written on women's suffrage in Tennessee and in general. But I kept getting up from my thinking, I've got that book. I've got the book on Tally House. I, got, I said, I've got that one. But I didn't realize, I, I've had this book for a long time and I didn't realize it was a Tennessee book. And um, anyway, I, I realized that there's a lot of, uh, I have a lot of reading to do, a lot of books I need to go back and add to my, co my collection. But I'm gonna be quiet and let everyone else ask questions, either um, use the chat feature or just turn on your audio and video if, if you like. Um, but if you choose the chat feature, I will um, I will read your question. But if you just wanna unmute yourself and um, ask a question, oh. we can do that. <laughs> Hi, Sue Marie. Hi. Hey. Good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> Give us a question, Sue. Um, no, it's very interesting, though. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, one, one thing, when, towards the end, you were talking about all of the um, schools for, for women throughout the state. Um, and some of the research I've done since I've been here is um, the, uh, the, the girls' school that was at the campus of Franklin Grove, and um, it was the uh, the female seminary at Franklin Grove. It was there from about 1830 till probably through the 1840s, but probably gone by 1850. And one thing I found interesting, I realized that doing there's quite a bit written about women's schools in, in Williamson County, and I think there were 23 yes, yes. total. Um, and one thing I, I wondered, I thought, um, did the fact that Williamson County had more schools uh, in 1850 than, it, or yeah, 1850 and 18, or, uh, yeah, 1850 uh, than any other county in Tennessee, did that affect women's literacy? And so no one had crunched those numbers, so I dug in the census somewhere and found uh, literacy numbers that turns out that more women in Williamson County are, were literate um, per capita than any other county in, our, in, in, in Tennessee. And so. That's what education does. That's what education does. Yeah, well, county is so blessed. I mean, there are a handful of counties in Tennessee that have have the density of women's education, and, and your county is absolutely one of them because of its rich history. Such a strong. Yeah, I do have a question. I was looking sure. at the map that you showed of the the women's schools in Tennessee, and from just looking, I think there was a dot on DeKalb County. Do you have any history on that? Yes, I do. And now you're going to ask me and I don't have my, my spreadsheet in front of me, but it's, it's what became um, Sumery became DeKalb County, Pure Fountain College okay. which in the 1800s accepted women. Yeah. So that's the one I'm referring to there. Okay. Because that, that's the school that my grandmother Truett went to and I was just, of course, had any history. <laughs> Yeah, Pure Fountain, um, and I don't know what Pure Fountain it may have, it may have been referencing what clean, lovely, fresh spring waters, but uh, maybe it was just the Pure Fountain of intellect or um, knowledge, who knows. Okay. I, I had a question also about the county I grew up in, Cheatham County. It had a, uh, it had a school on there as well. I was surprised okay. at that. All right, hold on. You're, you're now going to get me to pull up my spreadsheet. I should have had. Well, that. if it's too much trouble, I can shoot you an email. Okay. So, Dr. Evans, you're, you have a spreadsheet of all the schools. I do. I do. School. And I'm, I'm adding to it. <laughs> you know, obviously, on the spreadsheet, I'm including the name and the sources. So I'm anything anybody can email me. Again, I'm real easy. I'm mary.evans. It's Evans with an I at mtsu.edu. So Carol, um, I've written down Cheatham County, shoot me an email at that and I'll look it okay. up. And also what, what made you decide to, to go down this path of women's history and, and suffrage in particular? Well, I, th I think it's because of basically social movements. I, I had felt that, um, the issue of women's progress in our society is very complex. 
And um, we step through the study of women's history step by step and little by little. And so when the 75th anniversary of the 19th Amendment happened back in 1995, um, there was all these books on the perfect 36 were published. It was like we were having to reinvent the wheel. The woman who did the original research on this, by the way, and I'm, there's an image of that in the um, in the PowerPoint. Her name was A. Elizabeth Taylor, Antoinette Elizabeth Taylor. She was a PhD student at Vanderbilt. And, and she wrote her dissertation in the 1950s on um, woman suffrage movement in Tennessee. And already by the 1950s, it was lost knowledge so we base a lot on what her um, what her research was. She was able to still interview people who were still alive from, if you would believe, merely 30 years before. But she was the young new generation was having to sort of rediscover all of this. Anyway, by the time we get to the 75th anniversary in the 1990s, there's a resurgence of interest, but it was very much focused on suffrage, 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 suffrage. I had been um, living and working in Washington, DC at the Smithsonian Institution. And when I came back home to my home state of Tennessee, I was struck by what I thought to be a disconnect that, um, that we were not looking at all the ways in which women were involved in society, that we had like no women's history and then all of a sudden women were, were granted the right to vote in 1920. So that was really my mission was to flesh out all the development of women's civic work as we're coming to be more in the public sphere. And so there had really, until our book was published in, in 2013 on Tennessee Women of the Progressive Era, there'd never been anything like that, sort of looking at all the progressivisms of Tennessee if, uh, women, if you will, sort of what positioned them to take on this political struggle for suffrage. So that's how I got into it. It was just sort of an interest in wanting to flesh out the complexity of the story that I felt was too narrow and was not really indicative of the full action of what Tennessee women were capable of. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I have a question. Hey, Mary, it's Rachel. Hey, Rachel. Thank you so much for doing this for us tonight. We really appreciate it. Your presentation, You're so welcome. as always, is, it was just excellent. <laughs> and I miss seeing you. <laughs> I miss seeing you. <laughs> At some point, we'll have to get together. Um, but I do have a question. When we're thinking of the, the 100th commemoration of women's rights to vote, where, how do we approach the conversation beyond 1920? Particularly when we know African American women didn't receive the right to vote, Native American women as well, Asian American women. And you see that into the mid 1950s and 60s. And then, of course, how does that then move into and inform the women's movement for equal rights? And yeah. I think we're, we still have a, a handful of states that have yet to ratify the ERA. So how does that kind of transition the conversation when we're going to look beyond the 100th commemoration of the 19th Amendment and move forward with this discussion of women's rights to vote, but also full equality for women and all women, regardless of color? Yeah, and which, which is hopefully... I, I think when we find ourselves in a celebratory year, as we've had, um, celebration is important and we have to do that. We got to pat ourselves on the back. We got to go, yay, us. You know? Exactly. <laughs> let's, we made it. Let's, let's be happy about that. At the same time, we have to acknowledge the failures of what went on. And I think we're doing a lot of that. It's not revisionist history, it's just reality check that we have. Um, so much racism was embedded in that passage of the 19th Amendment. I mean, it really honestly was so fraught with the roughness of our racial past that we, if we don't address that, we're not being honest. And um, so we are, I think we're, we're more and more, we had a panel at MTSU this fall for Constitution Day specifically on the failures of suffrage. And then there were, <laughs> In, 20, in 2019, we had a yay, woman suffrage celebration. But a year later, we really wanted to talk about how did we really screw this up? And we brought a whole group of right. wonderful, just brilliant African-American women historians to the table to really talk about 
<laughs> from their perspective and it was like a good appropriate chastisement and it, it, mm -hmm. it, it has to be said. So the work is unending and as I say, nobody needs to get complacent. We need to move forward into 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Uh, we have a lot of work to do and I'm, I'm gonna be uh, voice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on this about when will we have too many women on the Supreme Court when we've got nine. So there you uh, go. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Revens, could, could you say something about was about was there any movement prior to 1919 for suffer, women's suffrage in Tennessee? Um, I know like in Washington, D.C. in 1869, I think a group of white men, women and black women attempted to register to vote. And obviously the movement goes back much further. But what was going on in Tennessee, if anything? Well, well the, the immediate precursor, of course, was um, the temperance movement. And I mentioned Selena Holman. The temperance movement was very successful, I think is the adjective I'm looking for. And they were able to really f get their political voice and lobby the legislators and get that kind of legislation passed to make Tennessee dry. And that was before the 18th Amendment. So similarly, because we were watching the states out West and the states out West had started providing suffrage for women, even when they were not yet states, when they were still territories. So that um, Western movement um, of of women voting even before we had the national vote was inching eastward. The east was the more regressive and, and unwilling to change. The west was kind of wide open to conceiving things in new ways for, you know, there are all sorts of reasons for that, but, um, and, they, and they vary territory and state by state. But Tennessee had made a success by, by 1919. We had municipal elections that had been passed and, um, yeah, there was some limited capacity, but the state legislators were still not wanting women to vote on them because they were concerned and worried about their entrenched power and didn't want to give that up. But we, we were pushing toward that. A wonderful, very complex map from 1920 that shows through speckles, and I should have included that in my PowerPoint, of, the different partial voting capabilities that different states had. And Tennessee had some partial capability, but it was late in coming. Are those municipal um, municipalities that allowed women to vote in, in Tennessee, were those, I assume, urban areas? It was, were some, some sections of the state more progressive than others or? No, it was, I, it was a, um, it was a piece of legislation passed by our general assembly. So it would have applied. Okay statewide. Any other questions from our, our group? They want to chime in? If not, I think we should thank Dr. Evans for her time tonight and her wonderful presentation. Um, we really appreciate it. It was really, really good. Well, you are so very welcome. And thank you, Blake, so much for having me. I'm most appreciative. Yeah. All right. I think someone has given a, a clap on their uh, a hand clap. So here's my hand clap as well. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Blessings. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you all for sticking with us. And uh, if you can view this on uh, on YouTube within a few days after we download it and do a little editing. Thank y'all so much.